Meeting is being recorded. Okay, so we'll come to the next seminar. Today's speaker, Tomas Yasuo, from speaking actually, I, I believe, from the United Kingdom, uh, from a very prestigious and very old university, Cambridge. This uh, postdoc with Anush Dalar, who working in finite multiple theory, and then we shall, we shall see today something. Okay, so the Okay, thank you for having me and inviting me here. Can you hear me properly? It's all fine. Yeah. All right. Okay. And you see the slide as well. Okay, all good. So yeah, uh, greetings from a rainy England today. I hope <laughs> it's better in, on your end. But uh, so I'll be speaking about the project um, I'm on with Anuj Dawar, as was said. Um, and just to explain, I, so I think this is something that is maybe coming into an attention of the mainstream. So it's a brand new discipline and therefore I'll spend most of the time just overviewing the basics. And then at the end, I'll just give you some, some new results that we have uh, made recently, but it's gonna be mostly about an overview of this whole new theory that we call game commonant okay and just to oh see uh, i have a new keyboard so no, <laughs> so maybe we'll flip to the end a couple of times before i get used to it just to give you a little bit of um uh, an overview of where this comes from if we decide to divide logic in theoretical computer science in the usual way you might be familiar with one or the other side depending on where you're coming from so that would be one side, which is pretty much interested in algorithms and questions are of the sort of expressiveness and limits of computation in terms of the speed and even uh, space that is needed. You, I think uh, you might all know all this quite well, but then there is this other research in logic, which more concerns with semantics and compositionality. And so to give you examples, oh, I did it again. Uh, I might get used to it, hopefully. Uh, so in the first bubble, there are uh, typical research uh, areas of automata theory, descriptive and computational complexity, CSPs, finite model theory, probability theory, graph theory, and so on. So these might be our tools or, or actual areas of studies. And in the other bubble, Traditionally, you would have the notational semantics of programming languages, higher order computation, domain theory. And as tools, typical tools used there would be duality theory, like stone duality, type theory, category theory, stuff like that. Okay. And this research area, this game common as, is trying to fit somewhere in the intersection. So the, it's, it's not entirely, um, you know, trying to do that just for the sake of trying to find the intersection, but it is using motivations from the logic and algorithms, but using tools largely known in the logic and semantics side. Okay, so we'll be mostly somewhere here, but motivations will come from here and the tools will come from here. And that's, that's the beauty of it, because so far, as you might know, these two areas have been developed mostly separately and the tools have been mostly disjoint and the communities also, I, I think are lacking a shared language to even talk to each other. So that's another thing we're trying to bring on the table has also allowed the two communities uh, to talk to each other and hopefully actually make, allow for larger progress in theoretical computer science. But to give you examples, it's not a unique approach or a unique example of something that's in the middle. We, we've seen something that you've definitely heard of would be the algebraic approach to CSP, which was highly successful and um, made the solution to the dichotomy. Uh, then there were structure limits by Osanade Mendez and Nesha Trail. You might have heard of stability theory and descriptive complexity being used and then the duality theory. 
in language recognition. So this area and these, these that I list here have been all developed recently. So this now is a hot spot in, in the <laughs> logic and theoretical computer science community, I would say. There's more and more stuff happening every year. So you're all welcome to join this hot bubble. Uh, but of course, if you're happy to be here in here, that's also fine. Uh, but OK, so this is this is where this area of research will fit in. And so, so that's why I have to basically only do the basics, because there's no time to cover all the advanced stuff. But at least I'll give you a little bit of a clue of what's going on. And so the main motivation comes from the logic and algorithm side. So let, let's, uh, let's discuss that first. You, uh, this is, as I mentioned, the CSP. Uh, so let's say you have a fixed graph. It's very difficult and it's known to be difficult to decide if for given A, there exists a homomorphism into B, right? And similarly, if you have an A, to decide if it's isomorphic to B. And these are one of some of the most important <laughs> questions and a lot of problems can be even translated in problems of this sort. And because these are so difficult, people are, have been looking at approximations to these. So instead of deciding if there is a homomorphism from A to B, they would be looking at some bigger relation. So something where if it doesn't even land here, there, would, there is no hope for homomorphism. So that would be an approximation. And similarly for isomorphism, something that's bigger, maybe easier to compute, then isomorphism, or in this case, homomorphism or existence of homomorphism. So it's all motivated by trying to simplify our life and try to find an approximation to these two relations. And one of the well-known approximations of the homomorphism problem is going back to 90s and probably even before, I don't know, uh, is this uh, approach of, it's going, uh, it, it's, a, it's a way of approximating it through some kind of games or equivalently as was proved by Colitis and Vardy also by looking at a logic fragment. So you would have a game, you would call it an existential capable game from A to B. And there are two players, spoiler and duplicator and duplicator has a winning strategy. That means there is some kind of approximation to homomorphism from A to B, right? I'll speak more about the game next, but it's important to also mention that this game can be explained fully in logical terms. So you would say, uh, you would write it like this, and that, that would just mean that the, for every positive existential k variable sentence, if it's true in A, it will be true in B as well. So that's some kind of um, also approximation of a homomorphism. And to say something about the game, as I promised, so there's spoiler will play on A and duplicator will play on B. So spoiler is always starting in A and spoiler is trying to show that there is no homomorphism from A to B, whereas duplicator is trying to approximate the homomorphism from A to B. And so in every turn, spoiler plays a pebble here. Uh, one of the selected K pebbles that there are so P, P1 to PK and duplicator responds with his own pebbles on the second structure and has to be a pebble of the same index. So also I call them here QI to QK, but it, the point is that these are indexed by the same numbers, by numbers from one to K. And at every turn we check if duplicator hasn't lost <laughs> and we do so by, by saying, okay, so we look at the mapping that are that is given by the pebbles. So the eight pebble mapping to the eight pebble here. If that is a partial homomorphism from A to B, then duplicator hasn't lost yet. And the duplicator wins if it can continue playing this game forever. Right. So this, this is a game. And you can notice if there is a homomorphism from A to B, the uh, duplicator has a strategy, it just plays according to the homomorphism, it just follows what the homomorphism does. So this is re really something weaker than having a homomorphism because maybe in this game, du uh, duplicator can play forever, but there would be no homomorphism. That's also possible. But anyway, so this is the game and can be approximated by logic. 
like are expressed in, the, in logical terms, like here. Okay. So, yeah. can he like take the pebble already placed and? Place yeah. So, the, there are only finitely many pebbles. So eventually, the spoiler will have to move a pebble somewhere else. Uh, technically speaking, uh, he can also remove it from a board if so if he wishes so. But that's not important. There are so many variants of this game, uh, and they all lead to the same sort of uh, expressibility. But uh, in the simplest ways, spoiler is placing pebbles and then moving them, right? Okay. And now, what started all this research on game semantics is this realization by, by these three, Samson Abramsky, Anush Dawar, and Pam Ming Wang in 2017. And they noticed uh, there's some Tom trying to enter the room over and over again. Okay, yes, I don't know. Okay, so th they noticed that the duplicator strategy in this existential capable game from A to B can be computed purely semantically. So it could be decided purely in terms of if there exists a homomorphism from some modification of A into B. So we call this modification PK. So this K is the index for the number of pebbles. So it's just you take a structure A, you compute structure PK of A, some kind of modification of it, and a homomorphism from PKA to B corresponds precisely to a duplicator winning strategy in such game. And now, uh, I mean, I, I, we can think about how this, uh, if, I, if I give you this as homework, you will figure it out how, how, to, <laughs> how to compute this PK. But uh, it suffices to say it actually, this PK will consist of all possible spoiler plays. Right in this capable game, I will give an example of how how such thing looks like if I give you a particle A. But um, this is the idea behind all or most of these uh, pebble games. We will always encode the spoiler uh, place on a given structure, and then we're asking if there's a homomorphism from PKA to B. So there, there are more common ones, but this is a specific example for the pebble game. And it has this important property. Okay. So the example, let's say A is a triangle, the triangle graph. So graph on three vertices. I, I named the vertices A, B, C. Okay. And now how can spoiler play? Well, he can play pebble one on A and then play pebble two on B. And from there, maybe play pebble P2 on C and so on. Or instead, play pebble P1 on C meaning he would move the one that was originally on A and move it to C, you know, and this is how, how the game sort of looks like, but that would be just, uh, just the uh, moves. Uh, when I'm constructing a graph, I should also give edges. So how do we do that? And it's basically all, we only put the edges that are relevant for the game, right? So that, that's the idea. So let's say uh, this was placed uh, the, the pebble two was placed on C after B, uh, pebble two was placed on B and where before it, pebble one was placed on A, right? And then we put an edge on the previous place where a different pebble was played. So this is pebble two. So we're looking for a different pebble than P2. Well, we only played different pebble P1 before. So the last time P1 was played is here. And it happens that C and A are related in the original graph. So that's this. So we put an edge, right? But, and then we continue. Oh, see, I did that. I did that. Okay. And so, for example, there would be also an edge between these two because P2 was played here, and previously a different pebble was P1, and there is an edge between B and A in here. And then, so there would be an edge in here, for example. Then when P1 on C is played, then the pre uh, previously a different pebble was P2. That's fine. And C and B have an edge so that we put an edge here, but we don't put an edge between P1 C here and P1A because this is not a different pebble, right? Even though there's an edge between C and A in the original graph. 
And you can imagine how this is done in general. Uh, for example, yeah, there's another edge here. Okay, so that um, so that's the main idea. You want to put basically the edges that matter for the game as as you're representing the place of the game semantically as a structure. Okay, and now let's say we su subscribe to this program in full. We say okay, so we try to replace any syntactic property by this semantic representation of the game. So, we'll, for example, can we prove this transitivity of this relation, which is a well-known property? It's very simple, actually. So if I know that any primitive or positive existential of k variable formula true in A is true in B, and the same is true from uh, B to C, then it should be true from A to C, right? So this is, this is standard, this is trivial. How can we prove it with our with this uh, construction, this PKA? On this relation only gives us a homomorphism from PKA to B, and this relation only gives us a homomorphism from PKB to C. And as you see, they, they don't type match. So we can't just compose them. There's something that needs to happen. And that is that actually you can notice that you can always extend this homomorphism from PKA to B. You can always extend it to a homomorphism of type PKA to PKB. Okay. And again, I will not go into details how this is done. It's not difficult at all. You just preserve the pebbles and the lengths, and you act as the F is uh, according to what F was doing. And uh, so now you see, because we can always lift it like that then the composition of this F bar with G will give us a homomorphism from PKA to C. So that this is a way of proving semantically something which is very simple and true also syntactically, okay? But uh, this, this fact that we can lift homomorphisms this way actually reveals an important property of this construction, of this PKA. And this is where getting to the territory of category theory. Okay, I will not explain category theory, um, but this uh, category theory, as I mentioned, was on the logic in semantics side of the things, traditionally used for semantics of programming languages, for example. And so uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a structure on a category of structures. So let's say in our case, we are interested in graphs and their homomorphisms. And so this is a structure on on this class of graphs and homomorphisms, where we have this operation PK, we have this lifting, and there will be some epsilon, which is the projection from the spoilers play, it returns the last plate vertex, okay? But it, that would be, this is just a trivial homomorphism. It's nothing, not too interesting, but this altogether, this data forms what is uh, known as a commona, right? So you might, uh, it's probably uh, sounds like a weird word to you. So uh, let me explain a little bit where this comes from, but I can't really do a full intro to category theory. But the common ad, as we said, is given by these three pieces of data. You construct from a, from a graph, a different graph. You can lift homomorphisms like this, and you have the projection. And this co is just a standard categorical terminology trick where you reverse a construction in the opposite direction. So you might have heard of monads. I think that that might have uh, that's more uh, common to hear about. Uh, maybe you study programming languages. There, uh, they're often used to represent uh, effects, like in Haskell. But they are also very well known from al from algebra, from studying algebras, or also. Uh, Topology, compact Hausdorff spaces are actually algebras of, of the ultra filter monad, for example, stuff like that. So this is uh, the dual notion, the monad, where I just flipped everything around. Um, and uh, just to say, uh, algebras really could be represented by monads. Maybe you know uh, monoids, groups, lattices. These are all examples of algebras. You give me a signature and equations. And anytime you have something like that, I can build a monad and then the your monoids, groups, vectors, lattices, 
will that meaning everything in that given signature that satisfies these equations can be represented as an algebra for monad, right? So the, the, anytime you have a monad, you, you speak about its algebras, right? And that is just homomorphism like this that satisfies these triangles, uh, uh, two identities, but it, it's just this important and well-known property and well-studied well fact when we look at algebra, uh, algebras, we can represent them as monads and their algebras, okay? And now going back to algebra, so I told you we have this PK, which represents Spoiler's place, but we, we notice that it is a co-monad, and now it's a dual to monad. So it's a co-monad, which is a dual, meaning it's a different a dual notion to monad, and with monads, we studied algebra. So now just a, uh, Natural question is, okay, so we have a co-monad, so what are its co-algebras, which is just the dual notion of algebras as if it was a monad. So everything dualized, and you can ask, it's just a natural question. If you study these sort of things, what are co-algebras for this co-monad called PK, the pebble co-monad maybe? Yeah. And so you just flip things around and that would be, uh, you know, by definition would be any homomorphism from A to PK of A that makes these two uh, uh, diagrams commute, right? So if you follow these arrows, you get the identity. And if you follow this arrow and this arrow, you get the same thing as if you follow this arrow and this arrow. Uh, I don't want to go too much into details. I just want to amaze you by... <laughs> <laughs> saying that this is actually something unexpected comes out of it, or at least it was very unexpected to me. So any co-algebra that exists for A will give you a representation of what can be called a Cape Pebble forest cover. Uh, and if you look at what these things are, that is a, tr uh, a tree decomp they correspond to three decompositions of your given graph. So to graph theorist, I think this is the summary. If you have a structure, it has a tree width, which is a combinatorial notion strictly less than K, if and only if there exists a co-algebra for this PK over A, okay? And so in summary, what happened here is, we had something motivated by games approximating homomorphisms. We expressed it semantically, fully semantically. We expressed this construct, uh, this this property uh, as a construction, and we noticed some categorical facts. And not only we noticed that it is uh, telling us something about logic or or these duplicator strategies, but also it does something for us that it can represent or uh, classify a, uh, a combinatorial notion, which is that of three width. So now we have this tight correspondence. We have this pebbling common as it both has something to say about logic and also a combinatorial parameter, but it doesn't stop there actually with logic. So we, we notice uh, this from PKA to B homomorphisms, right? this corresponded to preserving uh, validity of existential positive k variable formulas. Of course, if you have one going in one direction and the one going in the opposite direction, then these structures are logically equivalent, meaning they satisfy the same formulas in the existential positive k variable logic. But we can also say, okay, so what if we have those two homomorphisms and their liftings are actually inverses to each other? That's something also typically known as uh, isomorphism in the Cochleslie category. Okay, so this is it's not we're not making anything up. We're just checking categorical facts here, and these correspond. So this is equivalent to equivalence in the counting fragment. So it's the k-variable logic where we add counting quantifiers. Okay, so if you know this, just say there exists. I don't know seven vertices which have an edge somewhere or which satisfies some property. So these are counting quantifiers. And actually you can also represent uh, just the k-variable logic without 
uh, these counting quantifiers, and that that would be through these through some back and forth spans between free algebras. I will not go into the details. So overall, this uh, PK surprisingly captures uh, three logical equivalences and also a combinatorial notion. And that was just PK, uh, the PK meaning uh, pebble commona, but this doesn't stop there. Now there is this research uh, has been going on for uh, here, I, mean, I say four years maybe. Uh, and it, we have more and more commonas almost every day. So there is the error from Prasse commonad here and modal and pe pebble relation, Hella, guarded commonad, loosely guarded, hypergraphs and uh, what is it? Uh, bounded, uh, commonad for bounded quantifiers or, oh, this was hybrid, not hypergraphs. And they all have this property that they both capture some combinatorial pro uh, notion and also a logical fragment of some sort. So there is a lot of things going on and we can now express a lot of things from logic or combinatorics. In fact, when it comes to combinatorics, we can capture almost anything you can think of. So there is uh, this um, uh, recent result of me, Samson Abramsky and Thomas Paine. And we showed that whenever you have a class of isomorphism class of uh, closed class of structures, Delta, if it satisfies this property that uh, two structures are in the class, if and only if their disjoint union is in that class, then there is a common ad that classifies this class. So structure would be in that class if and only if it admits a co-algebra. All right. So really almost anything you can think of examples go, uh, I mean, any monotone or hereditary or minor closed uh, class which is closed under disjoint unions, or if you have a graph parameter which is maxing, for example, you always can define common ads for the, in these situations. Okay, so it's actually typically more difficult to get things that match a certain logic fragment uh, of certain logic. Okay, so that and that this would be just a you know, if it stopped there, it wouldn't be all that interesting if you could just express things by common ads. But uh, now the question is, can we do something with the common ads? Can we actually prove theorems that matter to people? And here, again, uh, I'm just listing things that happened in our program recently. And so telling you to get together with my other co-authors, Anuj Dawar and Luca Reggio, we proved some LOVA, some amorphism counting theorems. We reproved Vorsax and Groes theorems. And then they took our abstract categorical proof, this uh, Joaf Montacute and Nihil Shah, and used that same result by uh, applying it to the path, was it pebble relation common out and obtained a corresponding result for path width. For example, so uh, this this is an example of I think how the research should be going on. So you, you give a general proof in terms of category theory, and then you you just test the different commonas that you have, and you get new results just by checking the uh, the assumptions for these commonas. And this is exactly what happened here. Here they also prove homomorphism preservation theorems, very important in finite model theory, and have some could reprove some old stuff, but also have some new stuff here. Van Benton theorem also reproved. And Kursel theorems, uh, this is something I wanna talk next. And that's also research in this sort of uh, direction where we try to reprove stuff from uh, finite model theory in, term, in the language of common ads and then see how this generalizes and gives us new results. Uh, all right. So I will, in the next section, I will speak about our this, this result that we have here, but maybe I don't know if there are any questions at this point already about this general theme of doing things in terms of common ads, or what common ads are. <laughs> okay, leave it for later then. So that was the general introduction to common ads or the, the approach of using common ads in finite model theory. And now uh, just as an example of how such thing can be used and abused. <laughs> so you might all know Kursel's theorem. Um, 
which is a I here present a slightly specialized version. It's so it's about monadic second order formulas. Uh, the, the general fact is about counting monadic second order. But anyway, so let's fix a uh, monadic second order formula. So that's like first order, but you allow quantifiers over subsets of, of, of the structure. And you also fix a K. And then any graph of three width at most K. So that, that's a graph parameter that, uh, that this is concerned with. But if you don't know what it is, that's something, uh, it's a graph parameter. Uh, and it can be defined by the common as I said before. <laughs> uh, so if you, if, you, if you give me a graph of three bit at most k, checking whether this chosen fixed MSO formula holds for the graph runs in linear time in the size of g, OK? So this is Corsell's theorem from 1990s. Then later with Makovsky, they extended it to graphs of click width at most k. So that's a different uh, graph parameter. And but it, the result is the same. And just to tell you a little bit how, how the proof goes, they actually noticed that the class of graphs of three width at most k or click width at most k can be presented by uh, by giving you some fixed number of graphs that you start from, let's call them, I don't know, basic graphs, B1, B2, up to, I don't know, B, Z, okay? And then any other graph in this class is obtained by taking some of these and applying some operations to them. So maybe this joint union would be one of them, right? So we maybe combine B1, B2, and we'll stay a graph in that class. So if B1 was of three with at most k, B2 was of three with at most k, then there are disjoint union is as well as well. And there are other operations, not just disjoint union. And so you can, if I give you a graph of G uh, of three with at most k, and you find uh, you in the, the algorithm, the way it works is first, it builds you the way you constructed it from these basic graphs by using these operations. And then, so you build the graph, uh, sorry, you build a tree. It's like a term expression by using some operations and these basic graphs. And then you run a tree automaton on this uh, expression. And at the end, you, you, uh, you, have your, you end up with in some state and then you just check if that state is, uh, is within the those graphs that satisfy the property or not. Okay, so that intuitively is how these Corsell algorithms work. Algorithms. Okay, so and the reason why you can do such a thing, so you will always uh, you, your states of the automaton will be representatives of equivalence classes of these uh, of, of these um, uh, graphs. Um, but the reason why it works is what they call, or what's usually called Pfefferman Watt and sometimes Pfefferman Watt Mostovsky theorems. So the only reason why it works is because the operations that you use to generally generate your class satisfies the following property. So with the disjoint union, uh, it's, it looks like follows. So if you have two graphs, A1 and A2, B1, and they are logically equivalent, let's say in MSO, and you have A2B2, then the disjoint union of A1 and A2 will be logically equivalent in MSO to B1, B2. MSO is the monadic second order logic. All right, so this is something that's very important for the algorithm to work. Uh, and in fact, the, you have to check some sort of property like this for every operation that generates your class. So maybe you have an array operation and you will have graphs A1, B1 up to A and Bn, and you have operation op. Then if you apply operation for the on the graphs on the left, you get op A1 up to An, you apply it to operations on the right. Assuming these are well pairwise logically equivalent, 
you require that also the results are logically equivalent. And so this satisfying this property is a form of Pfefferman Watt theorem. So for every operation, you have to check it and prove that it satisfies this theorem. Okay. And so in our approach to Kursal's uh, algorithm, we needed to check this and we need, we, we, uh, we proved a commonadic version of this uh, Pfefferman Watt type theorem in general for any operation. And so how, how does it look like? So just to give you some sort of idea of how things look like before you get some concrete results, you prove something abstract first and then you instantiate. Okay, so assume you have a commona and it classifies a logic like we saw before. <clears throat> and you have an operation which is Ennery. Then you check that there is some Kleisley law. So that would be some transformation so you, you, let's say you apply the operations first and then you apply the common art operation. And then you are looking for a transformation. So that would be some kind of homomorphism into the operation applied to the common art applied to its each individual components first, right? So you're somehow transforming from you first apply the operations and then common art to you first apply the common art to every component and then the operation. And so that would be some kind of transformation from that to there. If it satisfies some conditions, then you will have a Pfefferman Watt Mostovsky theorem for the existential positive logic. You can the same, yeah. So uh, in order for this to be true, we needed to extend the theory of Jacobs that uh, that is specified for monoidal monads. And we need we extended it to NRA operations. We'll not go into the details. It's just a well-known categorical machinery to do things like that. Um, and actually, the same proof will give us also the same theorem, but for counting logics, like the counting fragments, as I mentioned before. And if we wanted to do the usual fragment, let's say the uh, first order logic without counting quantifiers. Um, then we, there is a, some extra thing to, that we needed to check. Uh, so this is something that doesn't follow from the general theory and we had to develop, but I don't have time to explain it actually. Uh, and uh, yeah, so it's just that it's possible as well. And it's extra conditions that we had to come up with. So overall, once you put all these together, you have some sort of abstract Purcell theorem commonadic Kursel theorem maybe. So let's say you have a class of structures generated from these generating structures or graphs B1 to Bn by using operations op, op1 to opm, right? So this delta would be obtained from this data by taking the basic graphs and applying the operations to them. It has to be, the delta would be the smallest such class closed under all of this, sorry. Sorry, this is C. Delta would be your tested property. So let's say this would be the graphs that satisfy a given formula. Yes, sorry. So these are two different things. Um, and then you, if every operation is smooth, is a smooth Kleisley law as we had before, then deciding if a structure falls in this class, meaning it satisfies the property that you ask for, can be done in linear time plus parsing, something that gives you the, the term. And this is not, uh, you can't get this in general, it has something that has to be given to you separately. And there's actually for three bit and click with these are separate algorithms that do that for you. And it's not guaranteed that it's always possible to do it quickly. Okay. And now we get MSO uh, Kursal theorems, those that I mentioned on the first slide by instantiating uh, with the correct Common art for it. So we will have a common art, errant for a common art for MSO. You check the operations are all satisfied, the Pfefferman Watt type theorems. And then we get the theorems, uh, Kursal theorems for uh, MSO that I mentioned on the first two, uh, first slide of this part. Okay. So in general, just to summarize, we have a new way of doing Pfefferman Watt 
Mastovsky theorems actually very very cool because it uh, normally when you would uh, were to prove something like that you would there would be a lot of guessing but this tells you actually the exact things you should check and then you know if it's true or not so that's uh, kind of cool the other cool thing is that we we made use of an old theory we just generalized it and it all worked beautifully and uh, it it is as uh, if, if you're working in game commoners it also gives you useful ways of uh, proving things about uh, when one common when equivalence uh, with respect to one logic classified by a common ad implies the same for the other common ad. So it's very useful as, as a technical tool as well. And the pattern here is really, we had a question in finite model theory. We, we uh, describe it in terms of common ads. It, that was a question that we then asked in you know category theory, if it can be solved categorically, we did that. And then that yield a solution in finite model theory. And as a result, actually, we, we learned something in category theory and finite model theory at the same time. So it gives us not just as a useful categorical exercise, but it, we, we got some new tools that we can use later on. And yeah, it's very nice. And it actually is quite compositional as uh, it's typical of the uh, logic and semantics side, as I mentioned earlier. And just, just finished up. There, this was just one, this, this project is really quite young and there's so much to do. So uh, everybody's invited to join their questions in terms of what other logic fragments we can capture, concrete ways of capturing twin width, uh, sharp depth or other graph parameters, looking at other model comparison games, stuff like that. Long-term problems that are also listed here as uh, yeah, we'll not describe them. So this is all from my side. Thank you very much for listening. So are there any questions? Okay, so much for the shrunk the, the usual result or, or the crucial type result I am aware of this. Uh, Done, done in a way that you compress the structure uh, on on the way towards towards the root yeah, of the decomposition. Uh -huh. it, yeah. it's like, it, it seems to be like, like uh, rather different than, than uh, Purcell who simply constructs the, the three automata. Very interesting. Yeah, I mean, um, this page doesn't necessarily ask you to do Coursell theorems, right? Just having a common app for sharp test okay. would be interesting. But of course, that's a, that you're going the step forward. Once you have a common app, what can you do with it? And that's Coursell, of course. That's one of the questions of Lovas type theorems, homomorphism preservation theorems, stuff like that. So that's that's interesting. So you say for sharp depth, there is a Coursell type theorem? Yes, there is a Coursell type theorem by I believe by by Kuba Berski and uh, Peter Hillian. Okay. It was published in LMCS. Okay. <coughs> Interesting. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, yeah, it's uh. It's since we always uh, basically only focus on one thing at a time. I mean, there is now so much we can try, of course. And yeah, we haven't tried all the possible Coursell theorems. <laughs> we just tried the basics so far. It was quite 
quite a lot already. Indeed. Let me ask a further question. So, um, the, uh, some of the, of the new methods in, in the area when you are considering graph logics and so forth is usually built around uh, the, this, this whole machinery of uh, transductions into certain structures. Yeah. Uh, is, is this anyhow usable also in, in, in this kind of theory? Yeah, so transductions is a more general thing than even interpretations, right? And we saw, yeah, we still don't know how to do interpretations even. Mm -hmm. But uh, I mean, the thing is, I can, I know how to do PP interpretations. So primitive positive, for example. And that's actually very beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, and now the question is, if there is some general story, it will not, I don't, with, the thing is, one thing to understand with uh, what we do here is, we are not hoping or uh, that we can do anything that's possible, mm -hmm. right? It's just that by reorganizing what's known, this way forces us to notice patterns that would be otherwise missed. And therefore, potentially we get either new results or new ways of looking at things. Right. So the, the point is not, you know, uh, do everything as possible. And I, I think that actually general FO interpretations mm -hmm. will be for us some kind of general gadget that doesn't really look very nice categorically. Right. So MSO, in, uh, uh, sorry, FO transductions, that's even going to be, that's going to be even worse. Right. Um, but so it will, that sort of thing we will be able to represent, but it will not look so natural. But I think, yeah, it's one of the very natural next steps. So here it's locality techniques. So it's like Geifman's uh, locality theorem or Hans. And then the interpretation that's really on the list that we need to explore further of how, how this looks abstractly and what can we do with it. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So any other questions? Hmm. No? Let's thank the speaker again. That's it for today.